Hello, I'm Noelle Cuny. Xavier, Calg and myself are proud to present our new book, Modernist Objects. It was published in the fall of 2020 by Clemson University Press. I have to say, it's, uh, it's been hugely rewarding working on this book. Um, it's not just the quality writing or the fine images. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the brilliant, multifarious ways in which modernist writers and artists engaged with materiality and I think shifted our sense of the subject-object divide lastingly. Um, today we have two or three authors who collaborated on this book and who are going to indulge in a little show-and-tell moment um, to tell us more about how they approached their subject matter. And towards the end of the presentation, we'll also hear from Ilan Aji and Jennifer Kilgore Karadek, who are going to um, tell us about the series, Seminal Modernisms. But first, let's hear from Xavier Kalk himself, uh, telling us about what is actually in the book. So, in a few words, Modernist Objects is a book that looks back on the exploration of materiality, commonly associated with the Anglo-American modernist moment, uh, with a view to assessing the relevance of this question for modernist and indeed new modernist studies um, today. Now, objects, objectification, uh, matter, materials, mediation, uh, products, commodities, things and thingness, are all studied in this book as something more and something other than the mere contextual correlatives to which they are sometimes uh, reduced. This book is therefore not a mere celebration, but a critical investigation, a, a disassembly, as the illustration on the cover is meant to suggest, of the modernist fascination and fear, use and misuse, uh, disgust and desire for the material world, uh, of which it is now a part. Thank you very much. In my chapter of Modernist Objects, I return to a phenomenon that has fascinated me for a long time, as it has many other people. This is how an object will sometimes seem to mark its own distance from me and from all human beings. The object will seem to say silently, see how I stand apart from you? Or it'll say, look, I'm self-contained. I don't need you. Or you have a mind and I don't. And for that reason, I'll always be holding something mysteriously in reserve, something you can never reach. Sometimes the self-withholding of things is alarming. Sometimes it's comforting. There may be few objects that would seem to state their distance more strongly than this ceramic seashell does. It's utterly smooth. It has none of the bumps and ridges of a natural shell, and so it may seem even less warm than a natural shell would. Its coolness is then compounded by its interior, which is covered in a pale blue-green reflective glaze. It's almost as if this object were designed to remind us of how objects would hold themselves. Yet in truth, I can only feel the distance of this particular object with effort. I can only hear it telling me how closed and self-sufficient it is by putting myself in a mind to hear it say that. And the main reason, I think, is that I've lived with it so long, but I see it many times every day. Being an object, it will always withhold something, but it's a dear friend all the same. My curiosity about objects stems not from any specific content of objects, but from my interest in relationships and frontiers. Objects at once confirm and challenge their own boundaries, and you can see one object that demonstrates this paradoxical property in my background now. It's a sample of textile based on Soviet artist Varvara Stepanova and Lyubov Popova's designs one of few original samples surviving from their factory work in the 1920s. You'd be forgiven to think this is actually no object at all. Coming out of a practice which the artist described as co-production of the material world, this piece merely creates preconditions for an object to emerge by means of mass production. The design is beautiful in that constructivist way, 
And I can tell you that the fabric to which the design is matched is a surprisingly soft kind of cotton velour. I imagine it being used for children's pajamas. The piece has little hooks, which suggest that it may have been a demonstration sample, one the factory would display with hope of garnering commissions. At the same time, there is no certainty that this piece presents the entirety of one such sample. Perhaps this is simply a discarded edge of sampling yardage, a cast off of a bigger, more important object. This piece of fabric survived only because Stepanova took it from the factory and kept it at home, repurposed as a reminder of practice and potentially even an object of entirely different order, perhaps a dust cloth. Now it is kept in a special collection at the Pushkin Museum in Moscow as a little relic of the Soviet avant-garde. It is a fragile object and in the next 10 years it may well disintegrate. But because it is an object in process, and because its role is to be co-producer of reality, it will not disappear. This object may yet transform, for example, into wallpaper in someone's virtual room. Jane Heap famously described her as the first American Dada. Baroness Elsa von Freitag Lorenhofen, often known simply as Baroness Elsa, was a daring poet, a pioneer assemblage sculptor and proto-performance artist associated with New York Dada. Around 1913, the Baroness started making assemblage sculptures using surprising arrays of found objects and junk scavenged on the streets of New York City, becoming one of the first uh, women artists to create assemblages. Scholars initially believed that the Baroness's sculptures were inspired by Duchamp's ready-mades, yet recent research has shown that in fact, the two artists came up with the idea of using um, ready-made objects independently, and that she was perhaps even the uncredited author of Duchamp's Fountain. Alongside her experiments with assemblage sculpture per se, the Baroness invented her own strikingly original form of object performance. She would adorn herself with um, eccentric, unexpected items such as tomato cans used as a bra, ice cream soda spoons used as earrings, a postage stamp stuck onto her cheeks, a coal scuttle used as a hat, light bulbs uh, sewn onto her clothes, and even an electric uh, battery tail light, which she reportedly once used to decorate uh, the bustle of her dress. The overall effect was the one of a living assemblage sculpture, uh, blurring the boundaries between the art sphere and everyday life, artist and artwork, uh, and subject and object. In her poem, Subjoyride, uh, the Baroness makes an ironic self-advertisement of sorts, uh, defining her poetics as ready to wear. She uh, mischievously suggests that since the true poetry of America is in its commodities, everyday items can become art objects uh, and poetic words can function as ready to wear accessories. So my chapter explores the strikingly original poetics of objects that emerges in the Baroness's protean intermedial works, uh, which radically redefined both the visual artwork and the poem. Hi, I'm Elena G, and I'm president of SEM and the co-editor of the Seminal Modernism series with Jennifer. Right, so I'm Jennifer Kilgore Karadak, and I'm secretary to the Society of the SEM, and I'm a co-editor for the Seminal Modernism series. We are very happy because we have this uh, wonderful modernist object to present you today. Um, you've heard about it from our dear colleagues and contributors to the series. I'd like to thank them very much. All of this is possible thanks to Clemson University Press and the special relationship we have uh, with them. It's the first volume in the series and it um, tells a lot about who we are, but not so much that we don't need to hear Jennifer tell us more about SEM now. Ah, the SEM, the Société d'Etudes Modernistes, was founded in 2013 
And uh, well, we have a biannual conference. Um, we do a lot of different activities, including seminars. And um, we are based in Paris, which is important because um, of Paris and everything it represents for modernism in the 1920s and following, and in the teens as well, of course. I mean, that's obvious. So um, we are an international association and we're excited about that. We're uh, also sometimes worried that some of the issues that um, modernists had in their times have become all of a sudden issues we want to um, talk about and to address in our time. So if you have manuscripts, um, ideas, proposals of monographs or collective um, volumes, please do send them to us because we want to expand the series. It has a couple of books in preparation already, but we think ahead into um, the further future and we'd like um, the society and the series to be as inclusive and as prolific as possible. So we're waiting to hear from you, but in the meantime, please have a look at Modernist Objects. Bye.